Thank you, everyone, for coming today um, for our online lecture. My name is Dot Porter, and on behalf of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, I'm delighted to welcome you today's online lecture. Today's online lecture is presented by Lynn Ransom and L.P. Coladangelo. I'll be introducing them in just a moment, but before I do, I have a few announcements and logistical items to share. While we have yet to announce the next online lecture, we invite you to find recordings of past events on the SIMS YouTube channel online lecture playlist. We also invite you to our weekly event, Coffee with a Codex, where we present manuscripts from our, our collection on Zoom in informal 30 minute show and tell style presentations. And I am going to put these links in the chat so you can see them as I mention them. The 16th annual Schoenberg Symposium on Manuscript Studies in the Digital Age will be held on November 16th through the 18th, 2023. This year's topic is the image of the book representing the Codex from Antiquity to the Past, and it will be hosted and is being organized by our colleague Nick Herman, the Sims um, cataloger of, or, sorry, Sims curator of manuscripts. The full information is online in the link that I dropped in the chat. Finally, if you're interested in following updates on this series and on our other events, I encourage you to sign up for our monthly newsletter if you haven't done so already. You can find links to the newsletter sign up and to our YouTube channel, which has a lot of other stuff besides just coffee with a codex on it, uh, on our website, where you can also find information about all of our other events and programs, including our fellowships and our journal. Turning now to the lecture, I want to remind everyone that we will have a question and answer period at the end, uh, which will be facilitated by Nick. If you have questions along the way, please go ahead and type them in the chat. And at the end of the lecture, we will pass these questions along to our speaker. You are, of course, welcome to ask your question directly at the end. And if you want to do that, please use the raise hand icon. I also want to remind you that we are recording this lecture and will post it to the Sims YouTube channel in due course. Okay, now finally on to the main event. Our speakers today are Lynn Ransom and L.P. Coladangelo. Lynn Ransom is Curator of Programs at the Schoenberg Institute and currently serves as the President and Executive Director of the Digital Scriptorium. Since 2008, Lynn has directed the Schoenberg Database of Manuscripts Project, and she's a founding member of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at Penn. Since 2020, she has led the project to redevelop the DS platform, known as DS 2.0, which ended with the successful launch of the DS catalog earlier this summer. Earlier in her career, Lynn was an art historian focusing on the role of imagery in illuminated manuscripts from the 13th to the 16th centuries. Her current research interests involve the provenance of medieval manuscripts and the research potential of name authorities related to manuscript studies and linked open data contexts based on her involvement with the Schoenberg database of manuscripts and projects such as the Mapping Manuscript Migrations Project, which was funded by a transatlantic platform Digging into Data Challenge Award in 2017. LP Coladangelo is the Digital Scriptorium Catalog Project and Data Manager and a PhD candidate in the College of Communication and Information at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. He specializes in knowledge organization of cultural heritage, metadata, information representation of folk traditions, digital humanities, semantic technologies, cultural transmission, and semiotics. With Miko Koho and Doug Emery, LP and Lynn co-authored the article, Wikibase Model for Pre-Modern Manuscript Metadata Harmonization, Linked Data Integration and Discovery, which was published in the Journal on Computing and Cultural Heritage in August. Today, they are going to talk about the DS catalog towards an online national union catalog of pre-modern manuscripts. So I'm gonna pass it along to Lynn, who I think is gonna speak first. 
Great. Thank you, Dot. I'm going to set up my screen. Can everyone see that? I can see that I'm on the title page now. Um, normally, at this point, the speaker will thank the organizer for giving them the opportunity to present. And since I'm the organizer, I can't really thank myself. Um, but I do want to acknowledge the privilege, privilege that I have uh, to use this platform to reach a, an audience um, of people from around the world to talk about this project that LP and I have been uh, working on for these many years. So I'm going to start with a quote. It would be a great but by no means superlative task to make a complete finding list of all extant manuscripts in volume form up to the year 1500, at least in European languages. And it will most likely be done before many years have passed. If done, it may be expected from our experience that thousands of lost works will be automatically discovered or rediscovered, centuries of the time of historical scholars and textual critics saved, myriads of historical mistakes spared, other myriads of feudal books prevented, and in general, a final saving made to human civilization of thousands of times the cost of the work. These words spoken by the now somewhat forgotten American librarian and medievalist Ernest Cushing Richardson to his fellow members of the Bibliographical Society in New York in 1909, eloquently address a long-standing problem facing medieval and pre-modern studies. That is the problem of access to and discovery of the primary source materials upon which the knowledge of our shared intellectual heritages are based. Here, Richardson is speaking primarily of European manuscripts, but he believed this issue to be true for other pre-modern manuscript cult cultures. And European manuscripts, I think, were simply just a much easier target to digest for an American and European audience. As a librarian and a scholar of medieval theology, Richardson understood that the number of known manuscript sources upon which his scholarship depended represented only the tip of the iceberg of what was available, but hidden in libraries, archives, and private collections around the world. Richardson himself calculated at one point, based on extrapolated evidence from existing print catalogs, that there were over 2 million understudied or unknown manuscripts in the world that were largely inaccessible to scholars due fundamentally to a lack of easy, easily accessible documentation. Today, while the situation has changed somewhat from Richardson's time, it really hasn't changed that much as, you, as, as much as you might think. Even though major libraries around the world have cataloged their manuscript collections, digitized their manuscript holdings, and made them available online, we are still only looking at a bigger tip of the proverbial iceberg. Compared to Richardson's time, access and discovery of our pre-modern manuscript heritage is so much better, but we are far from having a complete picture of what actually exists as many manuscripts remain hidden because many libraries and other cultural heritage institutions do not have the resources to make their collections as available as others. This is especially true for manuscripts cultures outside the European, European tradition, because historically, and for many reasons into which I won't go into now, but I think we're all more or less aware of, cataloging these collections has not been prioritized in the way that European manuscripts have. Thus, Richardson's concern expressed in this quotation about the problems of finding manuscripts and the consequences of this obscurity remain true today. The problem of finding manuscripts, as my predecessor at Digital Scriptorium, Deborah Cashin, has observed, is especially acute in North American collections because all pre-modern manuscripts in the US and Canada are displaced from their original locations. Unlike many European repositories that have held national collections for hundreds of years, American manuscript holdings reflect belated and diverse patterns of collecting, many degrees removed from primary ownership or the bonds of national patrimony. Thanks to the scattering winds of the trade, both licit and illicit in manuscripts over the last couple of centuries, there is no rhyme or reason, in other words, to what is in an American collection. So knowing where to look for a specific text or a type of manuscript is sometimes difficult, 
outside of the handful of, institution, uh, of institutions with large and well-documented collections. There are the known knowns, the known unknowns, and a whole lot of unknown unknowns, as a former defense secretary of the US government, uh, Donald Rumsfeld like to say, when it comes to manuscript research in America. Today, LP and I are here to talk about and present a national contribution to addressing the much larger, larger worldwide problem that so concerned Richardson, and that's the Digital Scriptorium Catalog. With the support of the Institute for Museum and Library Services and the Gladys Kriebel Del Delmas Foundation, the DS Catalog was developed and implemented in partnership with our team at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies and Digital Scriptorium a consortium of American institutions with collections of global pre-modern manuscripts. The beta version of the DS catalog was soft launched uh, in a somewhat local fashion in June, and today marks our official launch to the world. The DS catalog is the culmination of four years worth of work. It replaces the previous platform that many of you may be familiar with, and perhaps some of you may expect to see again. The decision to replace the original platform was not made lightly and not without good reason. The previous platform was first designed in 1997 and its records look something like what you see in these examples of preserved PDF files of legacy data that are now in the internet archive. While groundbreaking and digitally innovative at the time, the data model, which was based uh, on traditional approaches to descriptive cataloging and the technology required to support it were not, as we learned over the next couple of decades, sustainable at scale. These issues have been at length discussed elsewhere, but suffice it to say for now, when the previous technical host, the University of California at Berkeley, decided it would no longer support the software populating, um, the database software populating the records that you see here, Digital um, Scriptorium as an organization realized that a, a radical rethinking of the platform was required. So since 2019, when the redevelopment process um, actually began, the project team at the Schoenberg Institute, the DS Board of Directors, and many stakeholders have worked to build a light, lean, and sustainable platform for a national union catalog of pre-modern manuscripts built on linked open data practices and technologies to enhance uh, and ensure discoverability uh, uh, access to manuscripts in the U.S. My colleague LP will soon walk you through the platform showing you how the DS catalog can be used to find manuscripts in U.S. collections and to demonstrate the research potential of the linked data platform. But before we do that, I want to return to Richardson. What he did to try to solve the dearth of documentation on the world's pre-modern manuscripts bears important lessons that are applicable to today to today, and in fact, uh, provided the model for my own conception of how the new platform should operate. But his experiences, well, let's just say uh, they can also serve as a cautionary tale for anyone attempting uh, such a project at this scale. So Richardson was not the first to attempt a union catalog for manuscripts. And by union catalog, I mean a catalog that brings together disparate collections and one combined place for a single point of access. Many such catalogs exist, but not on the global scale that Richardson envisioned. And his approach and methodology, I believe, are rather unique. As noted earlier, the problem for Richardson was a lack of documentation or cataloging that could be copied and shared with scholars around the world. While Richardson was a serious scholar of medieval theology, having studied theology at Amherst College, and then at Hartford Theological Seminary in Connecticut. Um, he was also a librarian, a career he began at Amherst as an upperclassman, continued at the seminary before he became the librarian of Princeton University, which when he became librarian was then the College of New Jersey. And it's here where he spent most of his career from 1890 to 1925. At that point, he left Princeton, Princeton to become the honorary consultant in bibliography at the Library of Congress, where he successfully oversaw the coordination and expansion of the National Union Catalog of Printed Books Project at the Library of Congress from 1927 to 1934. 
By contemporary accounts, he was respected by his peers and was considered in his own time to be one of the architects of modern library science in the US with a vested interest in facilitating access and discovery through standard cataloging processes. So here he is at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis among a gathering of the American Library, of some American Library Association officials of which he was president elect at the time. Through his involvement in the ALA, Richard, Rich, Richardson shaped infrastructure and policies whose impact can still be felt today. Yet throughout his career as a librarian, he continued to pursue his passion for manuscript studies, teaching paleography at Princeton and spending six months out of each year abroad researching and searching for manuscripts to support his scholarship in medieval theological studies. As an advocate for universal classification standards in libraries, he was equally passionate about, uh, passionate about creating similar resources for manuscript studies, the likes of which um, he was alluding to in his 1901 speech to the Bibliographic Society that I quoted at the outset. Indeed, as part of his honorary consultancy at the Library of Congress, he began to work to develop a method <clears throat> documenting, for documenting the world's manuscripts. He called this project his Union World Catalog of Manuscript Books and published a demonstration of his method in six volumes from 1933 to 1997. And here you're looking at the title page to the sixth volume with the list of the volumes that he published up to that point um, on, the, on the left or right. I can never do my, my lefts and rights when I'm doing slides, but you get the point. So anyway, reflecting on the project and the preface to this final volume, the summary of method, which you see here, Richardson described his Union World catalog of manuscripts as little more than a card catalog that could be added to and rearranged over time. The method for producing this catalog, he believed, was applicable across manuscript traditions. And in this list of volumes, you can see that he executed or oversaw the execution of, I should, I should clarify, two demonstrations of the method, one from the manuscripts in Spain and Portugal that was carried out by Henry A. Grubbs, um, and that's volume two. Uh, Grubbs was a collaborator and a professor at Oberlin College at the time. And then another demonstration for what he called his Oriental Manuscripts, volume four, which used the Islamic collections at Princeton as a case study to show that his method could work across manuscript cultures. Employing a short uh, title catalog method that he had developed at Princeton, which captured only the basic information needed to find a book, author, title, publication info, uh, shelf mark or call number. He insisted that the entry on each manuscript in his catalog be limited in his world catalog, uh, be limited to one line of 100 to 120 characters and contain only the most basic information likely to help researchers identify manuscript copies of particular text they might want to consult. This was to include author, title, location, shelf mark, or other identifying numbers, dimension, folio count, material, and date if time and space permitted. Entries were to be typed on single seven and a half by 12 and a half centimeter index cards and placed at the top of each card in one line to facilitate convenient overlapping and photostatic copying. Authors' names were to be given in full, but other details were to be abbreviated to the highest possible degree. These guidelines were established so that the entries would fit onto one 29M linotype bar, which with compressed six-point type would permit the 100 to 120 characters per line if the catalog were intended to, make, to, to be printed, which he actually never felt was a necessary outcome. A slug would be created for each entry and kept in an envelope. The envelope, envelopes would be sorted alphabetically and updated as necessary. A typical entry in a printed version of the Union World Catalog would thus look something like this. Just large enough to be read without a magnifying lens. This entry informs us that a copy of Thomas Aquinas's Questionis Quod Libitalis can be found in the Bibliotheca Capitular in Tortusa, Spain, 
that it is number one in the printed catalog of the collection by Friedrich Heinrich Suso Denis and Emile Chatelain, published in 1856, and that it is in Latin, dates from the 13th century, is in membrane, which the abbreviation MB is for, or parchment, um, and that this is a quarto volume. In a summary of his method, he describes um, he, he describes his approach in even greater detail, which if done properly, uh, would only cost 10 cents per title to produce or 30 cents per title if the card catalog were to be printed. This demonstration experiment proved to Richardson that his method was quick, economical to execute, and easy to reproduce. And it is an, an is in his highly disciplined structuring of this manuscript information, his data, in other words, that particularly resonates with me in regard to the approach that we took to building the new DS catalog. At the beginning of his project, Richardson estimated that there were over 2,200,000 manuscripts to be included in the catalog. And while a sizable number, it was not, he felt, an impossible one especially if one kept to what he called his title align method. <clears throat> Once he began, however, he realized that this num number was possibly just a fraction of what was actually out there unreported. In the survey of manuscript book collections in Spain and Portugal, for example, Henry Grubbs uncovered almost double the 321 collections that Richard had initially located based on his catalog research. Richardson conceded that this initial underestimation should not have been a surprise, but it did make him realize that if this project were to move forward, it would never be completed before his lifetime. But this fact was not what prevented him from carrying the project forward. By this time, he published the sixth volume, the summary of method. By the time he had published the sixth volume in 1937, he had lost the backing of the American Library Association, which had supported the printing of the first three volumes. And he, and he was, after alienating most of his colleagues through his somewhat forcefully obsessive personality, left to publish the last three volumes out of his own pocket. At which point, and so he published them and in 1937, he just abandoned the project. He passed away two years later and his vision of a union world catalog of manuscripts, as well as his memory, or soon forgotten. To this day, I have not met a medievalist or a manuscript scholar who knows about his project until I mentioned it to them. And I have to credit Stephen Ferguson at Princeton University for bringing him to my attention when I was just starting out working on the Schoenberg database um, over 10 years ago. The downfall of this project can be attributed to several reasons. In the first place, he can never secure funding. More damaging though, his demonstration method was criticized by manuscript scholars, including Henry Grubbs and Nabi Amin Ferris, who had completed the work on the Oriental Manuscripts demonstration. They felt because of too many inaccuracy, that, that it was because of too many in, inaccuracies and errors in the resulting short title entries um, as they were published in the pr preliminary studies and method. And also because his method didn't capture enough information to be helpful to scholars in their opinion. It was a far cry indeed from the more academic approaches to manuscript description that were at the time becoming the gold standard, such as the catalogs of M.R. James, which gave detailed codicological analysis of the physical features of each manuscript, describing in detail the script or the style of illumination uh, and many other features of, of manuscripts that we all know can, can sort of delve deeply into and get lost in, in some of the detail. For Richardson, this level of description had no place in what was essentially for him a finding aid, a tool to help scholars in far-flung parts of the world identify on a global scale manuscripts they might want to know more about. It simply didn't need to be anything more than that to achieve its goal. And I think his peers who expected higher reflections of academic research had a hard time understanding that. In his preface to the sixth volume, he left a somewhat passively aggressive parting shot to his critics, singling out his erstwhile collaborator that illustrates his frustration that his entire motivation behind the project was fundamentally misunderstood. So he concludes um, his preface. It should be added that whatever the faults of this work, of whatever kind, 
the general editor is solely responsible. He refused, the general editor being Richardson, he refused to allow Dr. Grubbs, whose feeling of accuracy was outraged by the publication on uncorrected matter to take the time to edit out errors. It seemed to the editor, and still seems, wasted effort in a matter which in the end must be um, edited carefully. An attempt to edit carefully, and I will say, I want to acknowledge that he's editing his own words here, and I think he's rather emotional, and so they're a little bit awkward, but I hope you'll bear with me um, and, and, and try to decipher the point. An attempt to edit carefully at the stage would have cost far more money, and the results without the extensive and expensive preliminary standardizing projects described in the following pages would be worthless and misleading. The end of the preface. Richardson's words here may give you some idea of why his colleagues might have found him a little bit difficult to work with, but I submit to you on an important level that he was right and right to be defensive and speak out. The statement, which was about the editorial process, points to his larger premise on the whole project, which was to create essential, highly structured descriptions for millions of manuscripts on a platform that could be easily distributed to researchers on a large scale. His plan was ambitious, yes. Was it crazy? Not one bit. I hold up Richardson's story here as a cautionary tale, not only for us as the developers of the DS catalog who face the same issues that he faced, funding, lack of institutional will, or we could, we haven't faced those yet. Um, but I also hold it up, hold it up um, to you, our user community, in order to manage your expectations of what the DS catalog will be. It is not meant to be a descriptive catalog, but merely the tool to help you connect to the manuscripts that you want to consult and learn more about, and then contribute your knowledge back to the holding institution so that they can improve their data. I also hold it up as a precedent that can help our user community contextualize the approach we took in conceptualizing the platform. When we started the process of redevelopment, the DS board and several stakeholders outlined a list of principles that guided our decision-making process um, regarding the data model, the software, and our approach to what we considered good data. We limited our scope to being a finding aid and not a research tool. We require only the most minimal amount of data to represent uh, each manuscript in DS. We're not editing the descriptive data that our members contribute, and we make no judgments about whether it is right or wrong. And perhaps most controversial, controversial, controversially, we do not guarantee that records will include images, which is quite a departure from the previous platform. But because of these decisions, we believe that we have built a feasible and sustainable solution to this ongoing problem. I'm gonna end here so that LP can take over and tell more about the last listed principle of how the enrichment of our members' data with linked open data will expand its re research potential far beyond the limits of the DS catalog itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And then someone can just give me a holler if um if they're having trouble seeing, but I'll otherwise I'll begin. So um in the redevelopment of uh, digital scriptorium is digital scriptorium 2.0. We um had a general vision about what whoops about what that infrastructure would look like when um we took in member records transformed them and then published them as what we then called DS 2.0. And the structure was roughly this, is that we would take member structured data in any form uh, that it was available. And that could mean any encoding formats or um, using any kind of content standards. As Lynn said, we weren't gonna make any kind of evaluation or judgment in terms of what data we were getting, just that we would be able to match the data that uh, was given to us to the model that we were building. Uh, from there, we would convert the data 
and um, streamline it and aggregate it into a single spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet um, is literally just a CSV file, but it also represents all of the data points that then are um, uploaded into our database. From there, we would do some data enrichment, which I will talk about um, for the end of the presentation. Then, in, then enriched data would then be uh, uploaded to what we envisioned then as DS 2.0, but is now the DS catalog. And the DS catalog would now publish all of this aggregated and harmonized data as linked data, giving it back to the world um, and allowing scholars then um, to use DS uh, to use the DS catalog as a finding aid to lead them not just to uh, manuscript objects that might be of interest to them, but also to be able to have access to all kinds of linked open data about those manuscripts, as well as ultimately access to institutional records and to the institutions themselves to do further research. So what this catalog infrastructure looks like once um, we started to, to solidify around this vision was again, we would take institutional data, all those siloed databases, all those individual institutions and their records, and they're published in the Wikibase. And then what sits in front of the Wikibase is a user interface that's very similar to a, um, a, a more traditional online public catalog that you might see from, uh, from any library. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through first the user interface, the Wikibase after that, and then I'm going to tell you more about how we um, do that process of aggregating, harmonizing, transforming, and then and publishing data as linked data. So um, let me orient you first by showing you the user interface. We'll show you. I'll show you um, what it looks like in terms of keyword searching, how you're able to search by element or facet, including um, I'll show you where the advanced search is found, and then how to browse by element or facet. Um, after that, I will show you the Wikibase, sort of how this, um, how the underlying data supports the user, in, user interface. So we're kind of going to go from the front end to the back end. Um, and then uh, I will show you how a keyword search can also be um, executed in the Wikibase, uh, how you're able to browse items, um, click through items once you find them. You, um, you'll see how the, the linked data infrastructure of Wikibase allows this kind of connectivity through um, Kind of like web page to web page of the, the Wikibase interface. And then I'll also uh, highlight a Sparkle query, which is the, the query language that you use to, um, to query a linked database. So as Lynn mentioned, um, we have launched now officially the Digital Scriptorium catalog. You can find it at search.digital-scriptorium.org. This is an older screenshot when we were still loading, loading in legacy data. Um, this is a screenshot as of this week, and you will see um, where we are in terms of our current holdings. Um, we're at roughly 1,200 records and, um, and climbing. Uh, what this represents at this moment is a number of institutions that uh, did not have a, their own repositories um, outside of DS. So we um, migrated their legacy data from the old uh, database into this new one. And we've included um, some other, I, I suppose, earlier test cases in terms of uh, those who are willing to contribute their data early. Um, so you'll, you'll see both the legacy institutions and a number of other institutions that have now contributed what we would uh, consider new data. So it's not uh, their data from the, the the legacy records from the old catalog, but rather their new institutional records um, that were contributed. The reason this is important is because um, the contribution of institutional records means that they have control of what they do at the institutional level. As Lynn said, we don't edit or make any judgments about the data. We simply take it in wholesale as they give it to us. And then we uh, do the process of aggregating enriching and republishing it as linked data. So now I'm going to um, navigate us to the user interface. So if you'll give me a moment, I'm going to switch my screen. And what you should see here is a web page with the um, with the search interface that we find at search.digital-scriptorium.org. So let me... Um, 
orient you first to a couple of things, and then we'll click around um, as if we were using the catalog ourselves. So this will take you, this DS Home will take you to our the homepage of our organizational website. What was uh, important is that we kept um, the organization itself different from the um, from the catalog site. So now you have a, you know, the identity of the catalog is different um, from our organization. You can log in and create a um, an account, which will allow, which will enable you um, to be able to search your search history, you know, um, track your search history and also to bookmark pages. On the left-hand side here, you'll see a number of facets and you'll it'll become clearer uh, when we go through what the um, the database looks like on the back end, what is um, structuring and powering these facets, but you'll see a number of different ways in which um, the data can be browsed and searched and a number of different data values that are available to you to be able to to look at as you um, as you go along. You'll also see up here this is a keyword search or you can search, on any number of these elements, these data elements, these facets, or you can also construct uh, an advanced search. And let me, I'm just gonna make the screen a little bit bigger for those folks who may have trouble seeing it. So here's the advanced search momentarily. Okay. And you'll see here that you have up to three fields on this um, to be able to give search parameters. So you can I, you can search on keywords or you can search on any one of those data fields that's supported here in this list. And you can also create um, more advanced searches by using the, the Boolean uh, limiters in addition to that, when you click into any one of these, um, so you can kind of mix and match your options in terms of either searching by keyword or searching by a more structured list. So this would be all of the values that are available um, for this particular element or facet. Um, and some of them have quite extensive drop downs. These become um, organized alphabetically, whereas in the the other uh, view, you'll see in the facet view on the left-hand side column that we saw from the homepage, those are organized by the, the number of entries uh, of a given uh, of a given concept or entity. And I'll I'll show you the results of a of an advanced search when we get to the end of our um, presentation. So I'm going to go back to the homepage of the catalog. And I'm just going to, I can select any one of these number of institutions. And if I made a keyword search, um, same kind of search results page would appear. Okay. You'll see some short information that appears to sort of disambiguate what this is. This is um, representative of the current holding institution and then their shelf mark. And when you click on a page for their record, you'll see again the title that's been, or I should say the title of the record that's been given. If there is a IIIF enabled uh, image that will appear in this image viewer up here. You'll see links both to the um, institutional record if that's available and to our Wikibase record and I'll um, I'll show show you kind of how how that's structured um, as we go along. Here you also see all of the relevant metadata. So think of this as a library record, but in in our case we call it the DS record for this particular uh, item. We'll see here this is the DS ID. This is the persistent unique identifier that we have assigned to it. So every time that we take in uh, new records, each individual manuscript object is assigned a DS ID. Um, that DSID will be important for identifying it in a, not just in a linked data environment, but also for scholarship to uniquely identify this particular object within the DS environment. What we hope at some later date is that the DSIDs um, 
represent an ability to for for people to use them beyond DS to uniquely identify these objects. You'll see shelf mark information, titles assigned by the institution or available um, from the, the materials themselves. You'll see a number of uh, data fields. When we have enriched data, you'll see here that we have this little um, kind of offset box. In this case, where we have a faceted value, you can click on that value and it will take you to a faceted browsing of that particular value within the within the confines of the catalog. If you're interested in understanding more about this as a linked data value, then it opens up a new window this um, and allows you to, to view the linked data for that particular entity. So again, sort of link in catalog and then link out of catalog, if you will. All right. You'll see other information that was available from the record. Some of it organized as semi-structured data, like physical description or notes, keeping in mind that if you do a keyword search, it, the keyword search also will search any of these data fields. So that includes both the more structured data fields, but also um, the semi-structured data fields. And then finally, um, you'll see if there was an institutional link, it would be found here, but you can copy or and paste into an into another browser window. The IIIF manifest, which is uh, enabling that image viewer that we saw at the top. And then if we wanted to browse by holdings of a particular institution, we also have a faceted view for that. So that's roughly the, um, the user interface or what we call um, of, of the user interface for the, the search uh, catalog. And let me go back here and we're gonna kind of delve in even deeper. All right, so then you might be wondering how it is that, um, that we have all of this data aggregated. Um, what, what's the underlying infrastructure? What's the underlying model for how the data is organized? So, um, now I'm going to walk you through the more technical part and the behind the scenes part that powers all of the um, the things that you see in the, the search interface. So the data model is built on uh, a single sort of backbone of three entities. You'll see the DS, and those are the ones in green, the DS 2.0 record, the manuscript object, and the holding information. You'll also see a number of metadata elements that surround especially the DS 2.0 record, all of those things that would be relevant to try to either identify or disambiguate a manuscript object, things like names, um, time, you know, time dates, uh, places, languages, materials. Um, these are all authority controlled in blue. And then in the case of titles where we don't um, have a reliable authority for that, we do some data standardization so that we're able to, to facet um, and, and support that faceted uh, search and browse on the user interface. So again, the backbone of the model is a manuscript object as it's represented in the, in the, in the real world. Uh, we have the DS 2.0 record. That's a metadata description of a manuscript. So something that comes from uh, a metadata record from an institution, and then holding information, which can be both current and former holding information. Um, the idea behind this is that it conceptualizes uh, the institutional record, so that DS record where um, all that information that's that's uh, describing the manuscript is really um, conceptualized as being from the cataloger's observation. Um, it's a description that's been applied to the manuscript, but we're not making any judgments about it in terms of the reality of the manuscript. So those, those um, catalog descriptions can be overwritten at any time. So as scholarship changes or as descriptive practices change, we can change that information without fundamentally changing the fact that we identify the manuscript through a unique and persistent DSID. Um, holding information can change, uh, the descriptive information can change, but the, the actual identifier for the manuscript will not. And again, here's the relationships between them. We have the manuscript at the center, which is described, which sorry, which is um, has holding information, both current and former, and is described by a DS 2.0 record. 
So um, why did we make this change? Why, what was the value of, um, of creating a linked data model? Um, we found a problem in terms of not just the sustainability of the original DS catalog in terms of the amount of data that was um, that was needed to be generated in order to create a quote unquote complete description. Uh, the kind of problem that, that Lynn mentioned in terms of we just needed to be able to identify the manuscripts, not necessarily to describe them in full. But um, often the data was very messy and very disparate and people might be using um, different standards or values um, and so we needed a way that we could harmonize the data so that it was in one place and made sense for being in one place. Um, things that would support all of that kind of faceted browsing and searching that you, we saw in the user interface. So the, the most important thing that the redevelopment could conceptualize in terms of linked data was finding ways for us to share and exchange data from different institutional sources that might use different content standards, might apply different value standards, or use different structural standards like metadata schemas. And then that data could be processed not just by humans, for instance, in the user interface, that somebody could make sense of it, um, despite all of the differences in the data, but also that machines could process it, machines could read it, um, and that we could support um, more computational research, not just um, more traditional humanities research. So how does this linked data environment work? Um, so linked data is built on a grammar of triples. And these triples, um, just like any kind of basic language, um, represent a thing, a relationship between, a relationship and then another thing. So in this case, we would call in, in the resource description framework um, data structure, we refer to that as a subject predicate object statement. It defines uh, a semantic structure so that we can understand what subject predicate object means in order. When we see a triple occur, we know that it's some kind of entity or concept that has a relationship to, to another entity or concept. Um, in terms of the wiki-based infrastructure, the database that we're going to look at, you'll, you'll hear this referred to as items which have properties and then those properties have values, and often those values are other items. So they adhere to that same semantic structure of an entity has a relationship to a concept. In this case, we would say an item has a, a property um, that is assigned some value, usually another item. And that creates this whole network of items linked by properties that we can traverse and see an entire knowledge graph built um, within our own database. Um, the reason that this becomes useful to machines is that we can use the, the entire infrastructure of the internet in order to make uh, traversing this kind of network possible. So in the case of our own database, we would have, we would use URIs that I've represented here. These are specific um, entities within our database that are described in particular ways. Um, and they, they simply use the, the transfer protocol of the web to make connections between um, these entities. So for a machine, it would simply read that the, these URIs have, one URI has a relationship to another URI and all of those things are structured. For a human, we would read that a DS 2.0 record describes a DS um, uh, labeled manuscript, in this case, DS 1339. The other reason that linked data becomes important, not just so that we can connect things to other things, um, but also that we can contextualize and make sense of things that are messy. So I've shown here on the left, a list of uh, manuscript uh, records that are available in uh, the, the, the DS Wikibase that have, um, that describe Latin as the, the language of the manuscript object. But you'll see in the box here, um, these are the actual string values that came to us from the metadata records. So you'll see in some cases, they're very simple. In other cases, there's much, much more complex contextual information. One of the things that was central to the redevelopment project was not to make any changes to those um, 
to those string values, to the things that had been assigned by catalogers, because there's deep context there and there's a lot of extra information, but that's not, that's not information that a machine can read um, or a machine can process necessarily in, a, in, in, in terms of taking advantage of linked data. What we are, what the data model is able to do is to take those string values and qualify them or enrich them and enhance them with a connection to a more structured authority value. And this is what's happened in this case. So all of those string values are qualified by or linked to the value in our authority record in the DS catalog for Latin. And then that DS authority record is linked to the item for wi uh, the Wikidata item for Latin. And within the Wikidata item for Latin, that is linked to many other authority records. And you, I hope you can see the implications here is that we can take all of these disparate string values, which only have context in terms of the record. And now we can leverage all of this other linked information that might be available through all of these other authorities. So as all of these other uh, Wikidata pages and other authorities have additional linked data information, we can now start to traverse sort of those chains of links and start to bring in all of that data um, as and make connections between things that were not possible when it was just a series of um, string values that were uh, that were keyword searchable. Um, this becomes particularly powerful when we're talking about member data that is again siloed and we're aggregating it in one place. So we're taking in data that comes from many different sources that normally wouldn't be able to um, to connect and communicate. It's not interoperable on itself. We make it interoperable in the DS catalog, and then we connect out to outside resources to external authorities to enrich that data and make it more meaningful. That also means that other data that is enriched or uses those other external vocabularies can be linked to our data, thus enriching by making more connections. So let me um, now walk to the DS wiki base. So this is the database that sits behind the user interface. And we'll take a look what the, at what this looks like. And it, as a matter of fact, we can, we can use the, the record we were looking at as an example. So if I go to the search interface and I can click on the link data view, we'll start here. Um, so, this is what we call the DS or DS 2.0 record. The record is that um, series of cataloger uh, observations, the things that came from the um, from the metadata record that was given to us by the institution. Um, in in a Wikibase environment, you'll see a label here at the top. Oh, I should mention this is the um, the URL is uh, catalog.digital-scriptorium.org. So. You'll see up here, this is the, the title that's been given to this Wikidata item. So this is the item. We see here properties, which are themselves URIs that tell you what the property is if you were to click on them. Um, we'll go down here because we were talking about languages. So we see that this item has, a, has been described as having a language which is Latin. Here's the string value that was available from the metadata record. And then it is linked to or qualified by an authority value for Latin. And if I click on Latin here, I'll see the authority value and I'll see that the authority value is also linked to a Wikidata item. And if I were to put this QID into Wikidata, I would find that this is the, the, um, the item for Latin in, a, in the Wikidata database. Let me go back and then show you what, what the backbone looks like. So again, we have a property for described manuscript. So this item has a described manuscript and it describes DS262. Here is the manuscript object. And you'll see there's an, a number of properties that describe it, the DSID, of course, and then the holding information. And if I click on this holding information, it will now tell me more information about that particular holding. So I'm just following that backbone from the DS 2.0 record to the, to the manuscript object to its holding information. And you'll see here, it has a, it's held by Nelson Atkins. It has a current holding status. And here's the shelf mark 
Now keep in mind, all of that information is collapsed in one place in the, the catalog view, but it becomes a web of knowledge, if you will, in the Wikibase interface. Now, how did we get there? How do we um, how do we how do we make this data happen, so to speak? Um, so, reminding back, you know, reminding you back to the that general vision of taking in structured data, transforming it, um, and then publishing it. Uh, we worked out a more detailed workflow, um, as you'll see uh, in this image here, and we're gonna I'm gonna use this as the roadmap for the rest of what I'm gonna talk about that. Um, that shows you all of the decisions we made and all the ways in which um, the the data is manipulated and enriched uh, in order to get to those end products like the user interface and the wiki base. I will also mention that all of our documentation uh, is openly available on GitHub, github.com slash digital scriptorium. You'll see there a number of different repositories that um, that have uh, instructions for how we do data enrichment, um, the code we use, uh, and the the only thing you won't see there, all of our, our data dictionaries, the only thing you won't see there is um, the uh, the actual member data, which is kept in a private um, private repository. So the the initial data extraction uh, that happens from the institution, we are careful to to um, uh, careful custodians of that, but every every other part of our process um, is open and and uses open source software. Okay, so we have a number of different institutions, or maybe institutions that um, that they either have catalog records or they need catalog records created, and we help them with some with one or another. We either extract their original catalog records, or in the case of our member cataloging project. We do um, some preliminary cataloging work so that um, we can get uh, some initial data into the into the into the database. To remind you, you know, based on what Lynn said, and often in some cases that might be as simple as some identifier, uh, some basic identifying information as to where the the manuscript is and what it is, um, similar to to Richardson's slug. Okay. Uh, we take in many different kinds of data structures, um, and then we harmonize them in a single place, a single spreadsheet. So we have a series of um, metadata maps that map uh, different different data structures to um, to our own DS model, and then all of that information is harmonized in a single CSV spreadsheet. Uh, which accords with each of the columns of the spreadsheet accord with um, elements or, or entities in our data model. We then um, split that spreadsheet out by metadata element. So we'll have a list of names, a list of places that have been extracted, a list of materials, a list of genres. And we put each of those individual lists um, with some of the contextual information into a piece of software called OpenRefine. OpenRefine looks a little bit like this. It's just a, um, a data wrangling uh, tool. Um, you'll see here a, a spreadsheet that we've been that we were working on at one point. Um, it allows us to use what are called reconciliation services um, to try to match the string values that we have in our data with um, entities as they are in, in, a, in an existing ex external authority. So in this case, um, we were uh, enriching uh, subject information, taking the string values that were in the metadata records, and then trying to find a match in, um, in, in an external authority. And that's how we create those relationships between the string value and its, quali and its qualified um, relationship to an authority <clears throat> value. All of these instructions are in the GitHub. Um, so conceivably, if somebody wanted to do more work um, to uh, if they had DS, I would say if they had DS style um, spreadsheets, they could they could reconstitute our work. Um, if somebody wanted to rebuild DS tomorrow, in in a sense, they could. Um, so if you if you had uh, data that you wanted to reconcile, um, you could always use our our process or adapt our process. Um, 
that's available uh, through our GitHub documentation. The entities that we are performing reconciliation work are on the are the ones that are circled there in blue. Um, those represent the uh, metadata elements for which we have some kind of um, string value that accords with an external authority uh, that benefits from that kind of enrichment. Um, and that, that essentially that kind of standardization that we need in order to support the, the browsed, I'm sorry, the faceted browse and search that happens in the user interface. And that also allows machines to be able to process all of those different string values as the same entity. Um, these are the vocabularies that we use to align with the data values uh, in our records. So um, in the cases of centuries, materials, and roles, we use uh, the art and architecture of thesaurus. For languages, people, and organizations, we use Wikidata. For places, we use the Getty thesaurus of geographic names. And um, for subject and genre terms, we use a number of um, vocabularies in part because uh, we're using ones that are indicated either by the, the source data. So if a, a subject is indicated as um, coming from a particular vocabulary, we'll, we'll align to that particular vocabulary. Um, where, uh, where a vocabulary is not indicated, we, um, we have a, uh, an evaluate, sort of an evaluated list that we've made of, of um, kind of determinations of making sure that it's a linked data authority, making sure that it's something that's commonly used by the library community or GLAM community, um, you know, gallery, library, archive, museum community, um, something that's been thoroughly vetted. So um, so you'll see an, uh, our, our choices there in terms of um, the kinds of vocabularies we use um, are really determined by what um, what's best practice in terms of the, the, the communities that we um, get controlled vocabularies from. Those controlled vocabularies um, are then used to populate data dictionaries of reconciled values. So let me show you a little bit of what these look like. You'll see here, this is a, a, a data dictionary for places. So um, in the left-hand column, you'll see all of the string values that we get the, the, um, from metadata records. Uh, in some cases, you know, they, they're a little bit messy or there's, um, there's semi-structured information here. We um, structure it by aligning it with those same entities in the Getty, um, the source of geographic names. So the middle column are the assigned labels that come from, from Getty. And then the last column are the URIs that represent those concepts and make them machine processable that also come from the Getty vocabularies. We've done the same here for genre terms. So you'll see in the left-hand column, the genre terms as they occur in the uh, metadata record, the vocabulary that uh, was the source vocabulary. Um, and then again, authorized labels are the, the names as they appear in the authority file. And then the URI that makes the machine processable. Uh, once we've done these reconciliations, we kind of repeat the process of extracting the data and reconciling it um, that's done through the, the spreadsheet mapping. But now this time we have an enriched import spreadsheet. We have a single CSV file, kind of like the agnostic spreadsheet, but now it's enriched with all of those new um, connections to linked to the linked data authorities. And then that spreadsheet is used to populate the wiki base. Um, so that information is then used to upload and create all of those um, all of those items that we we walked through, the DS 2.0 record, the um, the manuscript object, the holding information, in addition to all of the internal DS authorities. So just to remind you here, this is the this is a DS uh, 2.0 record, and you'll see it also has the in the short title, the um, or name for this particular item, it has the DSID. Again, the recorded values are linked uh, to their authority values. Again, here, recorded values are qualified by some kind of contextual information or their authority. And then we can follow the chain. We can take the item to its described manuscript, to its holding information, and then remember, in the holding information, we can uh, we can also connect to the institutional record. So ultimately, when it comes back to um, to getting back to the institutional record, 
um, that's that's where this um, that's where this connection is made. So from the holding information, we can get back to uh, to Penn's catalog and find more detailed information in their catalog record that um, that doesn't fit into our data model. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to show you something. Uh, I'm going to show you a more. We're going to walk through a more detailed um, but relatively simple uh, Sparkle query. But in this case, this is the same information that I that I um, can could grab using a Sparkle query, um, and this basically kind of walks through the same process. We go from the record and all the links that I that I needed to get there to finally get to the institutional link. So there's a way to get it get to this information either by um, you know, browsing and using the facets on, this, on the user interface, and that that's completely valid. Um, you can click through the wiki base and get to this information, but ultimately, the most powerful part of it is using um, is using Sparkle queries to create your conditions for what it is you want to find, and then um, run the query to ultimately give you all of the data points that you were looking for. And then finally. All that information from the wiki base supports the catalog uh, search interface. So we've now come full circle. And again, this is everything that I've shown you uh, thus far in terms of the, the catalog and how the, the search facets are themselves supported by uh, the link data that's, that's happening in the background. So um, this is another advanced search that I uh, composed at a different date. This was looking for manuscripts that, uh, descriptions that had Aristotle as the author, they were in Latin, and the place of production was listed as France. There were two uh, particular um, manuscript objects that came up. But I'm also able to find that in more detailed information um, in the linked data view and I'm going to walk you through what, um, relatively briefly, but walk you through what a Sparkle query looks like, um, so you can get a sense of what if you would like to do this kind of work. Um, well, we can show you how to get started. So I should mention that. Let me go to the the wiki base. So in order to conduct one of these more uh, targeted queries. You would use here the uh, query service. You can you could use um, a keyword search, um, but that's only going to get you as far as searching the holding or searching the the records as they're held in the in the database. Um, the query service here will take you to um, a blank interface in order to put in all of your parameters. And while Sparkle can be very complicated, um, and I'm not going to I'm only going to brush the surface to kind of give you a sense of everything um, we're looking at here. What, I, what I'm hoping is, is that this encourages you to reach out to me um, and to our DS team. And so we can create kind of a, a community of scholars that might be interested in doing regular Sparkle querying um, in order to, to you know, capture the data in, in more interesting ways and take advantage of that, of that networked uh, idea of the, the linked data connections. Um, so just to give you just a, a basic over, uh, overview of what a Sparkle query looks like, the first thing are prefix declarations. These are shortcuts for being able to tell the, um, the query service uh, where to find this kind of information based on the URIs. Remember, um, the machines are just reading this portion. Um, they, they, the, all of the um, string values are meaningless to them. It's just going to be connections of, of URIs to URIs. In this case, I've declared a number of, uh, uh, actually, let me start here. And here I've declared all the variables, all the column headings of the things I want to see. And those will become clear in just a moment when I get down to the bottom of the query. Here, I have a number of um, variables that I've just made more human readable, but in these cases, all of these numbers represent things as they are in the wiki base. So you'll see these are our structured properties that represent things like name and authority file or the role for a particular person or entity. And then here are a series of just individual statements. If you think of these as sentences that give parameters for the things that are true about the data 
or um, encompass the boundaries of what I want to find. So for here, for this first set, is I want to find um, ultimately names that are linked to Aristotle that have, you know, Aristotle as an author. I want to find items that have a language of Latin. And then here I want to find things that have a place of, uh, of France. This should be for France. And then find me the manuscript identifier, the DSID for it. And then I even threw in some extra information here, like a date range. And so now I have all these, when I run this, I have all these individual data points that I can download into a JSON file or a CSV file into a spreadsheet. And then I could connect it to other data sets. I could do other things and manipulate that data. But now I have these, these I have a CSV or, or some other um, structured file of all of these, um, these data points that I can you know, now add to new data or sort or, or do kinds of computational analysis with. Um, and I, I hope that, um, you know, this, this will encourage you to reach out to us um, and to, you know, so that we can think about what it would look like to, to build some scholarship around this particular uh, portion of the, the database that I think um, is, is going to be its, its most enriching um, now that it's now that it's enabled so with that i really thank you for your time i know that was running through a lot of information but i hope it gives you a good overview about um what ds has in store in terms of its new catalog thank you so much lynn and, and lp uh for this uh Wonderful overview. First, the kind of um, uh, backstory uh, and the kind of historiography of, uh, of this project, and, and then a kind of um, uh, close look at the the kind of uh, uh, LP. I think, as you once said, how the how the sausage is made uh, with the, with the uh, the new catalog. Um, we have about fifteen minutes for questions. Uh, uh, we already have some some. Thank yous in the chat, uh, people saying this will be wildly useful. Uh, and I think uh, many of us uh, in the uh, scholarly community um, as manuscript researchers are really uh, pleased to see uh, DS on, on a firmer footing. So um, yeah, let's, let's open things up to questions. Uh, if anyone wants to raise their hand or uh, put a question in the chat. Um, now is the now is the time to do so. Someone is asking about a way to search by incipits. So the the you know the text. I mean, basically the beginning or perhaps the end end of a, a text. Is there potentially some facility uh, to do that? If that data is available, which it may or may not be, because keep in mind institutional uh, records may um, make, may or may not capture that information or may or may not structure it in particular ways. Um, so that's one caveat is if the information is available, there's two ways potentially to search. One is if you use the user interface, um, you can just do a, a regular keyword search. It's not an individual uh, metadata element. You can do a keyword search um, and that will search the, the notes field where that information would be kept. Um, in Sparkle, you can do a more structured search in which, um, and I, I can't show you how to do it off the top of my head, but um, what you would be able to do is to be able to do a structured search for searching a particular field and then looking for um, the text that it contains. So there's a way to do it. It's not going to be um, as simple as, you know, oh, here I'm going to search on on that particular field uh, for the, in that in the case of that particular kind of data, but there is a way to do it. And we, we have a question uh, about uh, a couple of questions here. Um, Matt Westerby asks uh, if you could talk about the choice to host Triple uh, IF uh, images uh, with the on the Internet Archive, uh, saying that's a 
the great idea. Yeah, it was it was um, done out of duress um, <laughs> because we had these series of images that we had kind of promised legacy institutions um, that we would try to find a place for them um, and try to triple IF um, host them. And uh, as I was doing some preliminary research, I found that um, you could uh, you could load, uh, you know, you could upload to to uh, Internet Archive they would give you um, IIIF manifests you could then use. So we have only done this for the legacy institutions as a sort of a one-time courtesy. However, um, if other institutions want to avail themselves and upload their own images, then you know that would generate manifests we could use. A lot of more well-resourced institutions may just have the ability to to do um, you know to do their own IIIF hosting. And and LP just as a follow up, is there a limitation to how much how many images you can upload to the internet archive i mean is there presumably you know they won't allow you know millions of images um if there is we didn't encounter it i can't say um for certain because we were i think we just had you know maybe several hundred images if that i i don't think we had i don't think we were even reaching into a thousand uh, um so I, yeah i can't speak to their to their limit by say account um but i'm i'm happy if other folks if quite if folks have questions about you know what would that look like in terms of how their institutions would do it i can put you in contact with um doug emery and jesse dummer who did the work on it and we have a question uh from barbara hag huglo about um if if there are standard names for cities churches uh and genres of manuscript like antiphoner antiphonary antiphonal antiphonale etc um i'm not sure well so we have we have a ser when we standardize titles we try to pick something like a generic um a generic title that would match um you know say in the case of uh, books of hours and you'd have like book book you know a title book of hours book of our hours use of rouen use of paris use of have what have you um they they are aggregated as just book of hours under one standard title um whether the rest of that information um is available in another part of the record is a good question in terms of um it might be assigned the value of genre of uh you know book of hours it might have a production place that matches the information that you'd be looking for so um i want to stress that this is data that's coming in from institutions of varying degrees of quality, granularity, et cetera. So um, we're, we're doing things to try to facilitate the aggregation and harmonization, but not necessarily able to punch up things where we just don't know more about it. Um, we're not able to do a ton of independent research other than to say like, yes, this value in the data matches this value in an external authority. Uh, and uh, a question from Toby Burroughs uh, about how you handle uh, production dates. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, the, the production dates come often from a semi-structured field. Um, they're parsed into more structured data. So a production date will have a display, right? There'll be a, um, a display of some date information. Um, and then it's qualified by three values. It's given a century value. So the centuries are structured. And then there's an earliest date, if that's available, and a latest date. Um, so then that would create the um, the conditions for having a, a date range if you wanted to, to search on it. Now, keep in mind, the, um, the date information is searchable only as a keyword in the search interface. But using Sparkle, you can create date ranges or exact dates. Uh, date queries, uh, which I did in that in that final example, I um I created you know a structured uh, query that allowed me to find to take the the information I had and then add in the parameters of between this date and this date, and that's really only available through through Sparkle. Um, and then a question from Danielle uh, at the KB. Um... Uh, so the, I, I think from the team working on the, 
um, Union catalog of medieval manuscripts in, in Dutch collections. Uh, and they're also using Wikibase. And, and uh, she writes, I was wondering what software was used for the front end interface. It doesn't look like the standard media wiki, wiki software. Correct, yeah. I, I, I was gonna say, I sort of answered that in the chat, but we can expand, LP can expand on that. I think there's more to be said about that. Yeah, I, I could simply say that um, what we did is, yeah, we we um, we worked with a developer, a design team, um, an outside um, web developer to create um, a custom interface that's built um, on a in Blacklight and uses solar for the pipeline. So it um, so it takes the the data from the wiki base, I believe, extracted as JSON. Um, flattened and then put into the the black light site. Um, and a question from Tuya Ainonen about uh, whether there's a mechanism for handling changes or updates in the source data from the libraries and incorporating that into DS and will it will it um, keep being updated? Yeah, so um, in in some ways, we're kind of working out what that process looks like in terms of human workflow, because we're we're now taking in original data, so we have we don't have anything necessarily yet to update. Um, but on some schedule, once we get a sense of how often folks may have changes in their their records, or to what extent the you know the 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 changes are happening at scale, like it might be a, a situation, you know, we don't know yet what. What it's going to look like where if uh you know institutions might need to update yearly they might need to update every five years or they just simply tell us when when they have updates um we don't know quite yet what that's going to look like so um i so i will mention that as in terms of the the human workflow but the the technical mechanism would be that um for the the records those would get overwritten so the records represent the most recent um, set of observations made by the home institution. So if there's more scholarship done, we would simply overwrite their record. Um, what makes this handy or useful in terms of DS is that if we've ingested their record once, we've assigned it a DS ID. So the second time around, um, we just simply, you know, we're, remember we're retaining the DS ID and then just replacing the the catalog record. But when we upload the records for the first time, we we can give them back that DSID so that they can use the DSID, um, put it in their own records or do it what they what they may. Um, and so that means that they can link their information to ours. There isn't going to be, I anticipate, an automated process for updating, um, because simply we'd be talking about many different siloed institutional records. Um, but at least it would give them a way of knowing which records they had in DS and which they didn't and which, you know, they could then sort by which items do we have in DS and which items have been, you know, recently updated or updated on a particular date. And then that would, you know, that would allow them to to essentially recontribute their records and we would re-upload them and, and take them through the same process that I described. Um, and just to note in the chat, uh, Doug Emery has chimed in with some uh, further uh, technical information on the handling of production dates. And we have a, a follow-up um, question from Dan Danielle, um, whether um, you use a Creative Commons license for the metadata or that, that's published, or is it copyrighted? It's open. We we own it. DS owns it because we've done the enrichment work, but it's open. So. So you can freely download from the wiki base if you wanted to do that. You could freely download from our GitHub repositories if you wanted the data dictionaries. Um, I actually think the data dictionaries are really valuable because they take all of these disparate sp string values and then match them to, and and I will, let me highlight, because I see him on the call. Hey, Mario. Mario Sassi, who is our uh, graduate fellow, former graduate fellow. Um, we have Justin Blair now from... Uh, uh, who's a um, a graduate assistant, and Rose McCandless, who is our new uh, manuscript fellow. Um, they're all doing a tremendous amount of work to make those alignments. 
So um, it's folks like Mario, Justin, and Rose, uh, and, and myself, who are who are doing a lot of work to to make that data really, really valuable. Um, and I'm so delighted that people can reuse it, and I hope that it proves to be of reuse because um, I think it's of really high quality. And obviously, you know, we're populating our wiki base with it, um, but I I think it would be useful if folks want to um, reuse it in their own projects. They're they're very welcome to. Wonderful. Well, um, I see that we have no further questions in the chat and we're just about at 1.30. Um, I think that the number of attendees and the number of questions and the kind of energy around this project shows how uh, important and essential it is to, you know, manuscript research in, in North America and, and around the world. And I think uh, we all need to give a, a round of applause to LP and to Lynn and to the whole project team uh, for their hard work uh, in, in, in getting uh, DS on a new firm footing. And, you know, we look forward to seeing it grow and expand and, uh, and flourish. So thank you all for attending. And Lynn, um, any, any last thoughts or any, any um, follow-up uh, uh, comments or messages for, the, for those in attendance? Well, only to say that uh, there is a link to a feedback form. So if you're on the search interface uh, and you have uh, comments or suggestions to make, please feel free to uh, click on that link and tell us what you think. That, that information would be really helpful. We're in the beta phase of this. And so we will be continuing to look at, at how, um, how the catalog, the search interface and the wiki base um, are working now that they're out in the world. So any information that you can give us as feedback would be much appreciated. And thank you everyone for coming. It was great to see everyone here. Thanks everyone and uh, stay tuned for the announcement of the next uh, Sims uh, online lecture next month.